Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. I am your host, James Just. With me today is author extraordinaire, Mr. John Cameron. Hello, How you doing James? today, John? Oh, I'm all right, John. I'm all right. It's been mm -hmm. a long day, but you know, mm -hmm. a longer week, but I'm all right. How mm -hmm. you doing? I'm, I'm doing all right. Still able to stand up and take nourishment. You know? Hey, you know what? That's yeah. one of the best things about the new set is we get to stand up every day now. Yes. And yeah, we can prove Much that. better we can, for the back. We can stand up. We can prove. Well, regulatory burdens, John, that's what we're talking about tonight in, in kind of the thrust of the show. And, you know, regulatory burdens empower control freaks, right? And we had a couple of stories, right? About one, this first one is about uh, zoning regulations and how these zoning reg regulations allow people with ulterior motives, shall we say. <gasps> people have ulterior <laughs> motives? People yeah, with that's ulterior a, motives uh, to... Yeah, that's an IJ case, right? I'm yeah, and in this particular case, we have this <laughs> guy who had his... Sorry uh, about that, folks. Who? <laughs> who had his, he had a uh, auto repair shop for yeah. like 30 years yeah. in the same spot, nice yeah. clean yeah. shop, mm -hmm. but the city council decided that they didn't want an auto shop there anymore and so these zoned it, it out of existence. Because it wasn't pretty enough. Zoned it out of existence and replaced it with, I don't know, a, just a store, uh, essentially. Uh, uh, it's, not a, it's not like they replaced it with anything pretty, they just replaced it with a different mm. store. Well, I suspect there might be an ulterior motive. Um, you know, the gentleman on the screen is black, and one of the one of the few things that that people can do uh, to lift themselves up by their bootstraps is is start a a blue collar business. You know, you can't if you've got a felony in your background, which a lot of people in um, minority groups do, unfortunately, because they make everything in this country a felony and they can't afford good lawyers. Then they can't get contractor's license, they can't become an architect or a doctor or a lawyer or anything else, but what they can do is turn a wrench. Um, and, um, you know, the fact that the zoning laws prevent you from being a, a, a backyard mechanic or a driveway mechanic, which is the way a lot of people can make a really good living, you have to get in a building that's properly zoned and then the control freaks take over. You know, the regulations, uh, I know a guy who moved to Florida and um, he had a thriving mechanics business here and they, he said he was going to have to hire another person just to take care of the regulatory stuff. Yeah. So this guy, they moved out of his uh, thriving business. Uh, and I don't know how many bays he's got there. He's got a couple of bays, so that means he's probably got a couple of mechanics working for him, which means that, you know, he's created some wealth in the neighborhood. <laughs> Uh, probably brought some people in and trained them up so some people who maybe didn't have great educations can learn a valuable trade and make some good money. And uh, they didn't want them there. And I think there might have been even more ulterior motives than we know about. Well, yeah. it is, I live here in Sacramento and they did a similar thing down Stockton Boulevard. Yeah. Is the outlawed, you know, automa new, auto new, you know, mechanic shops yeah, and auto yeah. repair shops and new uh, things with drive throughs and yeah. Uh, you know that that's just the first step. In a couple of years, they're going to come back and they're going to rezone those places out of existence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, you can see the writing on the wall. Yeah. Well, and there he probably had two things going on. Uh, they don't like the businesses because they're dirty and pretty soon we're all going to have electric cars or mules, as the case may be. Um, but the, uh, the existing auto repair shops probably lobbied pretty hard to uh, not seeing the future to keep uh, new auto repair businesses from coming in. And the existing restaurants certainly didn't want fast food coming in and taking their business. So, um, you know, people are short-sighted. They don't realize that, that once that ball gets rolling, they can't stop it. Well, I'm a little more skeptical than you, John, having lived in uh, Oak Park, or what they now call North Oak Park. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are the beginning uh, stages of gentrification. These yeah. are what drive yeah. the poor people out yeah. and re to be get replaced by people with more money. Yeah. And that's where yeah. it starts. Yeah. It starts yeah. by getting the, the low-end businesses out. Mm -hmm. And you know, once you can get the low-end businesses out, then you can get the low-end people out. Yeah. And I think that's the ultimate, ultimate goal of these things. Oh, no, I was saying that in different, if, if, I, if you heard something different from me, I was saying that in different words. Yeah, yeah, yeah you don't want, you know, you don't want the Mexican restaurant there. What, what who's, who's running it? Mexicans. So, uh, you know, um, again, an entry-level business, you can you can scrape up some money, get an SBA loan, uh, go in and, and refurb an old restaurant that's already there and put out a better product and make a very good living. But you know, then there'd be Mexicans in the neighborhood. So, um, yeah, no, huh? it's 
And that's the thing. It's, it's politics has strange bedfellows, and then you get a bunch of these things where you get little groups here, mm -hmm. and next thing you know, you get these disastrous policies. But we're going to move on about disastrous policies, John, because we've got another, shall we say, people with ulterior motives. Yes. We're talking about the, uh, the nuclear industry and ha why, despite all the claims of wanting uh, clean energy, we have objectively refused to go to go nuclear, despite the fact that well, France are, they, has been nuclear are, for a long time. They are now, though. I mean, there are people are, you know, there's, there's, uh, I guess, Warren Buffett and some other people are, are basically uh, in somewhere in the Midwest putting in a new nuclear power plant. And, and they fight it tooth and nail, um, but a, a, a large part of it's ignorance, and a large part of it is believing clowns that, that, uh, that, uh, uh, put together faulty papers. I don't remember the name of the guy, but in the nuclear uh, folks in our, our audience, a um, bunch of things happen with nuclear. First of all, one of the first studies, um, which in, in hindsight, after looking at it and taking it apart, was probably all lies. The guy did a study of fruit flies and radiation and uh, said that he discovered all sorts of uh, genetic anomalies in the fruit flies after they were exposed to radiation, which would result in, in basically mutant fruit flies. Turns out that when they drilled down on that study years later, they found out that it was full of crap. Probably the best study to look at is one that was done and buried um, and lied about. They looked at people who were uh, survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, the whole idea, there's this theory called, I had to write it down because I can't remember anything anymore, linear no threshold. <coughs> and what that means supposedly is that any amount of radiation will have a negative effect on, on DNA and, and, and cause increased cancers and deaths and all the rest of that. <coughs> Excuse me. And a uh, study they did in Hiroshima and Nagasaki indicated that um, that didn't happen. And they didn't figure it out until much later. But what happens is cells repair themselves. Just like sun damage, yes, it, it is cumulative, but it's not linear, no threshold. So if it was, that would mean same kind of radiation, gamma radiation. You walk outside and you get five minutes of sun, right? And then the next day you walk outside, get five minutes of sun, five minutes of sun. So if the theory about linear, no threshold was right, everybody would have died of skin cancer. Everybody. Because you add that, that exposure over the course of a lifetime, even if people like me take care of their skin, and, and it would mean that there'd be uh, um, all this mutation and cell breakdown and DNA and all the rest of that. And the third thing going on at the article, we, we actually do a bunch of homework before we do the show, folks. I know it doesn't feel like it, um, is that um, they lie and then they lie again about their lies and then they pressure people who, who point out the lies and since it's in academia, they make sure they can't publish their papers and on and on and on. And in this country, as, as James pointed out, um, Jimmy Carter in the 1970s put through a law that said that uh, you can't recycle nuclear material, which you can. In France, they do 95% recycling of nuclear material. Um, and if at any stage in the process it becomes weapons grade material. And it's going to, for a second, a day, a month, whatever, it's going to be at, at one point in time nuclear weapons grade material. But the French have been doing it in, since the 50s and I'm pretty sure we can do it at least as well as the French can. And then the other thing on the regulatory side of this is that uh, they, um, if we regulated cars the same way we, we regulated nuclear power plants, Every car would cost about $10 million because they, they pretend that this model, this plant that was built in, let's say, Oklahoma, um, doesn't exist. And they make you prove that exactly the same plant somewhere else will be safe and effective and do what you say and all the rest of that. And the regulatory steps are like 10 years long. And then you have all these NIMBYs that get on board. Um, there are people who were, were high up who are genuine friends of the earth in some of the major hardcore green organizations who said that they would not only live next to a, uh, a, a private nuclear reactor, 
but they would live inside one. So if people really look at the science, it is, it is uh, the cleanest thing that's out there. You don't have a nuclear power plant killing uh, a thousand golden eagles like Altamont Pass Wind Farm does. No, and there's an interesting thing about uh, radiation is the uh, more dangerous it is, the shorter its lifespan is. Yeah. So if you, someone says, well, this radiation will be around for uh, 100,000 years, a um, million years, well, then it's not very dangerous. Mm. It's the stuff that's only going to be around, the half-life is toxic hours or weeks. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff that's dangerous. Yeah. And so that's why these, the long-term radiation uh, sicknesses don't work out. It's yeah. the people who get exposed to that initial yeah. batch of radiation are the ones that get sick. People who come by in a few years, all the real dangerous radiation is gone. We have time for one more nuclear story, or do you want to move on? Uh, well, I'll, try, I'll try to be quick. All Mike, right, Mike Schellenberger. Quick, Schellenberger was a hardcore green anti-nuclear, uh, and then he started actually looking at the science behind it. And he uh, did a wonderful TED talk that uh, you folks should watch. Um, there was a bunch of school kids who wore dosometers, dosimeters, on a trip from France to Japan, and they, uh, they, they visited Fukushima. I don't know if they visited Chernobyl, but I think they might have also visited Chernobyl. And um, they, they followed the radiation that those people were subject to, and the greatest amount of radiation they got was going through security at the airport and then being high up in an airplane. And the least amount they got on it was visiting Fukushima. So. Yeah, um, it's, it's a bugaboo, and, and if the green industry isn't paying for it and the oil companies aren't paying for it uh, to fight it, then I don't know who is. And well, that's the way it wor the world works, folks. And that's going to actually bring us a nice segue into Mr. Richard Fields, because Richard has a, a we'll call it a rant this week, about uh, no, corporate Richard cronies. Yeah, it's a long one. It's like four-minute rant about corporate cronies mm -hmm. and how the I want to hear it. How they have uh, I hear interjected it. themselves into the bureaucracy. So let's see what Richard's got to say this week. Hi, this is Richard Fields with Report from the Fields. Libertarians have long made the argument that government regulation of business is worse than useless. It is quite often counterproductive. This is because of the prevalence of something called regulatory capture. Most people pay little attention to who gets appointed to the myriad federal three-letter agencies that do most of the regulation of business at the federal level. One group of people that pays a lot of attention to that phenomenon, that would be the people who own and manage the businesses being regulated. They are very interested in making sure that the people running regulatory agencies are one of their own. It's called regulatory capture. It's why K Street is lined with the offices of very expensive business lobbyists. It's why the Washington, D.C. metro area leads the United States in per capita income. Those lobbyists are happily, are largely successful at making sure that federal regulatory agencies are almost always staffed at all levels of management by people who are very friendly to the industries they regulate. Usually, said regulators, actually are former employees of the industries, industries they regulate and go back to work for those say, self same industries once their stint in Washington is over. Oh, and uh, uh, while those corporate cronies are in Washington working for a fraction of what they did and will work for in the future, making, working back in the industries they regulate, they do a little moonlighting. It's called insider trading. They know before the investing public does what new regulations are coming down the pike and how they will how those regulations will affect the values of the companies they regulate and they probably trade the stocks of those companies accordingly here is a, here is an excellent example robert kaplan was a 20 year veteran of wall street vampire squid goldman sachs he was appointed president of the federal reserve dallas branch presumably at less pay than he was making at Goldman. No worries, though. He picked up a little extra pocket money by making rather large trades in stocks like Delta Airlines, Chevron, and Apple the exact week in 2020 
that then President Trump was shutting down the economy. But we know he was not engaging in insider trading. No, no, nothing notorious like that. The Fed's own inspector general said so. They said it was only the appearance of a conflict of interest. Kaplan did resign, though. Well, guess what? He's back, back at Goldman Sachs, no less, as vice chairman, where he will give strategic advice to the Wall Street Giants' clients globally, working closely with its team across global banking and markets and asset and wealth management, the bank said in a statement. Well, good for him. And good for the Federal Reserve, keeping us all safe from the failure of banks that are too big to fail. And who are a lot of those K Street lobbyists that make all of this turnstile turning possible? Why, of course, congressmen looking for a pay raise, doing a rather cushy retirement gig by trading on their contacts at the Hill. That's how regulation actually works. I'm Richard Fields with this week's report from the fields. See you again next week. You know, John, it's this is nothing that us as libertarians or those even the libertarian minded couldn't have told you was going to happen. The minute the regulations start manipulating the economy, the economy is going to try to manipulate the regulations. Mm -hmm. It's just it's the natural course of events. Huh? And to expect any different is foolishness. Mm. Well, there's a way to fix it. Yeah. Oh, an easy way. Just shrink the heck out of the government, uh, get rid of the Fed, for one thing, uh, get rid of 95% of regulatory agencies. Uh, people are self-regulating by nature. Yeah. You know? well, we do have an example. We have Harvey, the Harvey, Javier Malay way, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. break the chainsaw is, to the government. That's which it. is already uh, cut inflation enormously. They're opening up... Uh, I think the second biggest shale oil and gas deposits in the world, or third biggest, uh, within a year or two, um, Argentina is going to be a major exporter of nice, clean uh, natural gas and uh, oil that we're going to need for a whole lot of reasons. And uh, that that uh, that shale gas is going to be feeding the world and warming the world, but we can't do it because Biden said we can't export it. So go figure. Yeah, go figure. Yeah. But there is the there is the way to forward. But the way that's not forward is Lena Khan at the FTC, the Federal Trades Commission, if memory serves. She has another unique theory of that lost in court, John. Hmm. And you I know, am so convoluted I can't remember it right. Now. <laughs> and that's the thing. It was a convoluted. Which which convoluted well, theory? Oh, that's right. Was, she was? The, the theory was. And correct me if I'm wrong. And jump in, stop me, talk over me, whatever you want to do. Um, that people who invest in uh, organizations which are actually uh, supposedly guilty of restraint of trade or unfair trade practices are themselves guilty. So how in the world you could, you could uh, connect those dots there? That's like, uh, let's say I invested uh, my, my tiny little money in... Um, the, the companies that have been sued wrongfully and convicted wrongfully for making people uh, um, addicted to oxy, and I have to own their stock, then you could come and throw me in jail because I own their stock. And so, of course, the 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 judge in the um, um, the judge in it was wonderful. In I, I wish I'd remembered to quote on. He said that that uh, there's no. There's not even a tenuous link here. There's no form of any kind of law or regulation anywhere on the books to make this case, and you shouldn't have brought it. It was basically that straightforward. Yeah, and the judge Hoyt wrote, yeah. under Mrs. Kahn's theory, inventive theory, any asset manager could be sued for a company's alleged anti-competitive conduct if it holds shares. Yeah. So if your asset manager happens to hold shares, and yeah, he can be sued for... Mm -hmm. All kinds of goofy yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just the FTC and really. If, is. It, once it's FTC, because that's an asset manager, I manage my own portfolio, let's say. Could I then be sued? Logically, I could. Yeah. No? Yeah. Well, the extension, it's, it's insidious mm. how, well, how she's, deep you know, they want to go. You know, basically, um, you know, we live in a command economy now that we, we're number 
25 and dropping on economic freedom in the world. We used to be number one. Uh, and whenever, when we were higher, the, the economy was ticking along at a much better rate. There was uh, greater employment, lower inflation, greater productivity, more people had jobs, something only like 55% of the possible workforce in this country is actually working. Yeah, yeah something yeah. like that, yeah. 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 And the yeah, rest the of them workforce are, participation is relatively is, low. Is, is tiny. And, uh, well, but if that's a return to a more uh, single family outlook, then actually I'm not opposed no, to that. If, if that meant that there is uh, there are two parents in a household and one of them's taking care of the house and the kids and doing the shopping and financial planning and all the rest of that, that uh, housewives or house husbands or house others used to do, then it's a wonderful thing because all the studies everywhere show that having two parents in the home instead of a single parent in the home leads to, at, I think it's about uh, two standard deviations, yeah, strong of causation, correlation, and to better kids. And it's, and we're not, the effort that the single mothers or single parents can put in mm. is, we're not, is not a question. Mm. It's just a matter of it's far easier to raise child, when, to raise children when you have assistance and mm -hmm. when you have assistance yeah. that is yeah. deeply involved. And almost inevitably, if it's a male and a female in the household and they're both working, despite childcare and all the rest of that, the woman typically carries a greater hourly burden of work because she does more rearing, child rearing and more housewifing. Or, yeah. Housekeeping. Housekeeping, yeah. Yeah, house, yeah. yeah, house managing. House yeah, that's, managing. that's even a better word, house managing. House managing. Yeah. It's, so anyway, these goofy legal theories that the, are continue to try and, uh, and extend is just astonishing. And then, John, some of these same officials, uh, you know, this one's in the SBA officials, don't want to show up when uh, the Congress asks them about, hey, what are these programs you're doing and what's the real goal? In this particular case, the Small Business Administration is running a get out the vote campaign. For the Democratic Party. Uh, yes. It's only. Well, only for the Democratic Party. Yes. Well, they're... It's not specifically stated as only for the Democrat Party, but, but that's when you what look they're at, doing. Yes, when you look at the where they do where they are doing the voter and, outreach, and, and who they're outreaching to, it's clear who they're trying to who they're helping. And and they're, we are our taxpayer our tax dollars and the money we're printing is paying for that. And when they're doing that, instead of helping out small businesses, uh, then they are not actually doing their job. Oh, do we have time to get to the Soros one? Um, we can get to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so then uh, let's go down, let's we'll move on that, because that was actually kind of a relatively short concept. It's just, let's be aware that our bureaucracies are avoiding accountability. Hmm. You mean the SBA one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, and they're, they're, they're working for, they're using our dime to push political agenda. I don't care if they were working for the Republicans. They shouldn't be shouldn't be doing it. Libertarians, I might give them a pass, but you know. If yeah. we didn't show up to a congressional hearing, what would happen to us? Go to jail. So, uh, all right. Yeah. So, S Soros and the U.S. government, we're going to move on to the next one real quick. Um, George Soros and the government are, they're working to attack the Twitter in Brazil. Yeah. Right? The, the Twitter files, which are basically the, the Br Brazilian version, version of, the of, Twitter files, of the Twitter files, which opened up uh, all the censorship and the uh, Stanford Internet Observatory and all the rest of that. And this is crazy insidious because what happens is Soros comes in and gives seed money to these NGOs, which are basically uh, political in nature, who then uh, put out attacks saying that people who are, are fighting censorship are actually censoring. Yeah, so they, it's the big lie. And let's go, and then they go and put grants, totaling $62 million from the U.S. government to, to, to do these things. So it's yeah. not just, hey, if Soros wants to spend his money, he, he's allowed. But when you start spending tax day, U.S. taxpayers' yeah. money. So he, that $62 million is what he put in over three years. But what happens is, then when these NGOs are up, since he's the largest donor to the Democratic Party, right, $62 million, uh, then, uh, so it's actually the numbers are the same, so you might be right. Then he goes to his cronies and said, oh, you need to give grants to these NGOs. So he gives the seed money, the NGO is formed, it looks like it's a standard old nonprofit, but it's basically politi political operatives for his hazy worldview, which is pretty hateful. And then he talks to the U.S. government, 
into giving them more money so that he doesn't have to give them any more money because our tax dollars are now paying to um, basically help a Brazilian dictator crush his opposition. All right, yeah, man, that's kind of it. Yep. A nice short nutshell there, John. Yep. Right. We've got about three minutes left, John, so let's go to Let's go to CIA. Let's go to let's go down to the bottom of the page, John. The CIA is using our uh, ad tracking data. Hmm. They're buying yeah. it. Yeah. 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 So they're for those of us that uh, have been paying attention, right? We know this. I like this. The fact that that's up on the screen now. I like that. Good and job, guys and, and gals. We've, we've been uh, complaining about this for years. How this government is just going around the ban of accessing data by buying it. Hmm. And well, also, they're ignoring the bans, and in addition to that, they're buying even more data, because the data's there. Yeah, it, yeah. and that's the question. Is, is purchasing data you are not legally allowed to obtain, is it legal? Hmm. Uh, you, you know, it doesn't seem so to me, hmm. right? No, no. It's none of their business. And they, they did this to uh, go after people uh, in the riots, the Floyd riots. They did it, uh, uh, they were more determined in their efforts than the January 6th rioters. Um, and uh, they've, you know, basically, I, every single time I've given a choice on the internet, it says, it says I, I click the button, it says, don't sell my data, right? Don't sell my data. Uh, and normally, um, I, I use DuckDuckGo or something else like that that, that doesn't track anyway. Um, but. You know, all I got to do is for a half a second be somewhere like in the process of getting to a website where I can't, in that process, I haven't been able to click don't sell my data while I'm going from point A to point B, capture my data and sell it. I mean, and if somebody's following me around and paying for my data, then you're wasting your money, folks, because I lead a very boring writer's life. I walk, I write, I sleep, I work out. Why do you want to know what I'm doing, right? Yeah, and well, the, it's not that actually your data is actually all that dangerous. It's what the potential future is. If you look up in Canada, they're passing a, a law where essentially they're going to criminalize thought crimes. Yeah, well, they already have. And but since that, that whole regime is going to get thrown out in the next election, I have a feeling all those laws are going to get overturned. And so, but that's where the real danger yeah. of this kind yeah. of system comes into play, yeah. Yeah. is because now they're going to retroactively, retro, retroactively, good retroactively. Lord. retroactively. I can speak, John. I've got. I, yeah, I know how to talk. And you've done very well tonight. <laughs> and I commend you. Up retroactively, to, up to retro react. Whatever <laughs> they're retroactively going to go back and, yeah. and create uh, and create criminals. Yep. Out, of, out of speech that was perfectly fine a couple of years ago, they're going to say now it's not fine, mm -hmm. and which is very scary to me, John. It's just very scary. The world we are, we are, we are marching towards. It's, it's a scary place, and unfortunately about 50% of the people out there. And we're out of time. Thank you, John. Thank you guys for everybody for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank the crew for working hard inside. Have a good night, and please remember to love everybody. Love everybody.